Welcome to the Wild Neighbor Speaker Series. We're happy to have you. My name is Jaya Torres with Austin Water Wildland Conservation. This series is a collaboration with Travis County Natural Resources, who co-manages the BCP with us. Um, don't forget to put any questions that you may have in the Q&A box, and we'll address them after the presentation. Today, we're happy to have a City of Austin Balcones Canyonlands Preserve biologist, Colin Strickland. Colin is a second generation caver who works at the city of Austin's BCP as a cave biologist. One of his main goals is to shed light on central Texas cave organisms through photography and videography. Colin, I'll hand it over to you. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Colin Strickland. Um, I'm a <laughs> biologist at the Balcony awesome. Canyon Lane Preserve. Uh, I mostly deal with cave biology and today I'm going to take you kind of on a journey starting at the entrance of a cave and going into the caves and seeing what we see along the way as we get deeper into the cave. So let me share my presentation. All right, Central Texas cave life. So uh, many of y'all probably know the Balcones Canyon Land Preserves Canyon Lands Preserve is in Western Travis County. Uh, it's a large preserve that was put in place to protect eight endangered species and 27 species of concern. Uh, most people have heard about Golden Cheek Warbler and the Black Cap Vireo, but most people don't know that almost all of those other species are karst invertebrates. So of the species of concern, there's two plants and 25 other karst invertebrates, and then there's six endangered karst invertebrates. So basically almost the entire preserve is for karst invertebrates, but no one's ever heard of any of them. So uh, I'm gonna show you all some of this. So one of the first things you'll notice when you approach a cave is uh, the plant life is a little bit different around the entrance. You'll start to see things like ferns and moss and everything inside the entrance of the cave. This is because there's not so much sun and all the moisture and everything uh, can remain. And so this provides interesting habitat for plants that couldn't survive on the surface and can only handle this moisture condition. And also you'll start to see other organisms that don't fare too well in Texas summers, but they do find in this humid cave environment. So this is, a little land snail that you'll see them around Austin on like a rainy day, but most of the time they gotta hide under logs and stuff just to stay moist enough. But in the caves, it's near 100% humidity, so they can just cruise around doing their thing all the time. So organisms like this, they like to live in caves but don't really have to, are called troglophiles. So these guys, from the Greek troglos for cave and philio for love, troglophiles are the cave lovers. So basically, they, they can survive on the surface, but they also really like the moist, cool conditions inside the cave. So uh, some of these include the Gulf Coast toad. You'll find these near the entrance of caves a lot of times. You find land snails like this guy. So like, I videoed this in like the middle of summer in August a few years ago when it hadn't rained in over a month. Yet this guy was just cruising along. And then everybody loves these Western slimy sound banders. These guys hang out in the cave and eat all sorts of karst invertebrates. Sometimes they come out when it rains and move around, but they can survive in the cave for a long time. They can actually get pretty big. Um, I read online that they can get up to eight inches long. The biggest I've ever seen is maybe a seven incher, um, but they're pretty cool. And they're basically like apex predator down in the cave ecosystem. So they eat all the little karst invertebrates. So uh, you can see here, uh, he's about to eat a springtail. Uh, 
I first turned my light on, I got really annoyed. And then it decided, hey, I can I can see you and I eat you now. It's much easier to do things. Also, I sometimes wondered how do they hunt when they can't. As you can see here, sometimes the food just comes straight to them. They don't have to do anything. Just put them in the mouth and do it like that little um, cricket nymph. But yeah, he's on the lookout now. On the left, you see a little springtail in a second when he starts eyeing it. Mm. But this springtail is really lucky. He ends up going right underneath his chin before he could get him. But there's a little mite in the foreground who is not so lucky. It ends up becoming dinner. It's pretty cool stuff. I've never actually seen these guys eating before, so pretty interesting. So the next group I'm gonna tell you about are the troglozines. From the Greek troglos for cave and xenos for guest, troglozines are the part-time cave dwellers. So most of y'all will probably think about bats. And yeah, we've got Mexican free-tailed bats, but most of our caves are pretty small around here. And so we tend to find just a small groups of these tricolored bats, maybe, I don't know, less than 10 generally. Uh, they're known as Perimyota subclavus. So, troglozines are really important because the cave ecosystem has almost no nutrients due to the fact that there's no photosynthesis going on. The only nutrients that come in are what is like washed into the cave or what is brought in by organisms such as bats or, and other troglozines. Another troglozine you'll see. Uh, at the entrance of caves in great numbers are Leobundinum townsendii, the standard daddy long legs. Uh, these guys form these huge maps that people call beards sometimes. And uh, they can be in the many thousands, but they don't bite or anything. I just have a hard time trying to climb out of the cave without squishing them. Sometimes I just have to sit there for a long time and let them get out of the way. Uh, one of my favorite troglozines are these super adorable cliff chirping frogs. So these are some pretty small little frogs. They hang out in the cave during the day and at nighttime they climb out of the cave and look for food in the forest. Uh, they have this really cool technique where they sit in these little holes in the walls and sing and the hole amplifies their voice so that they can find mates over a farther distance. And they're also really good climbers. They can pretty much climb up any surface, even like inverted surfaces and stuff. So you don't normally think you'll find frogs in Texas up on top of a plateau, but these guys are nice and moist down in their caves. So some other troglozines are the mammals. My coworker Drew Thompson set up this game camera as couple years back and I pieced together this video of all the critters coming out of Slaughter Creek Cave. So there's raccoons that live in there. Standard possums. And we got porcupines now. Porcupines seem to have moved in in the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years. They weren't as prevalent back in the day, but now they're here. So yeah, all these mammals, they're pretty wary of predators because with so much mammal activity, there's a lot of mammal smell and it attracts predators. This porcupine's so skittish when the wind blows, he jumps. He's kind of freaked out, but he has good reason to be wary because there's a lot of predators that check out the cave entrance. So here you got a gray fox checking it out, smelling all those raccoons and possums. 
get a whole pack of coyotes. And even a bobcat. So pretty cool. There's a lot of activity. I've started putting a lot of game camera at that the entrances of caves, both inside and out, to see all this action going on. And recently, I got to catch a ringtail. So we don't see these very often because they're super shy. Um, but I had a game camera set up. You can see this one. It's kind of neat. Yeah, apparently these guys will sit outside the cave and wait. And all the cave tickets come out around sunset. And it can be like, they can be a little bit of a ticket. And then they'll just sit there. And so see you. This guy's tickets come down the cave. They don't have to start in the middle. This was only video a couple weeks ago, and I got that camera still set up, so hopefully that guy's going to come back some more. So all these mammals coming in and out of the cave are providing a lot of nutrients. So on the left, you can see uh, a lot of times their scat has seeds in it, which will sprout, and then the plants will rot, and that will help feed bacteria and fungus. And on the right here, you can see uh, porcupine scat and for some reason the porcupine scat always has this distinctive white mushrooms on them which I call porcupine mushrooms but I would like to figure out what they actually are but due to the small size of most of our caves around here we don't generally have super big caves with like large bat colonies most of them are pretty small and crawly so the most important troglozine in central Texas is the Texas cave cricket uh, these guys can be found in large numbers in some caves with many hundreds of thousands of them roosting on the ceiling. So when you have this many crickets together, not only do they provide food to predators, but also they basically rain cricket scat onto the floor, producing a really nice layer of cricket guano, which then uh, provides nutrients for fungus and bacteria, which then feed other organisms. So yeah, everybody loves tasty cave crickets. On the left here, you can see this eyeless cave spider, Sicarina, uh, eating a cricket nymph that it caught. On the right here, you can see this, uh, um, the scorpion, a cave scorpion, Pseudoeroctinus rodelli, he's ripped off an entire cricket's leg and he's chewing on it. And here you can see this plethodon salaman who tried to eat this cricket whole. Uh, he ended up spitting it out because he thought I was trying to eat him, which I felt really bad about. But yeah, all this cricket guano rains down, making a nice manure for bacteria and fungus, which is then fed on by these tiny springtails, Pseudocinella violenta. So these guys are super important because they basically form the base of the food chain and everything else eats them. As you can see in this cricket guano covered floor, there are extremely large numbers of these springtails. So yeah, you can see all the fungal mycelia growing off the cricket guano. So yeah, these little springtails provide a prey for pseudoscorpions and spiders. Some other organisms that benefit from all the nutrients in the guano are these eyeless cave millipedes, Cambolus biobia and these eyeless land snails, Helicodiscus eigenmanni. So yeah, 
it's interesting these uh Campbell and millipedes they they're blind but they have some sort of light sensing organ because when you shine a light on them they curl up in a little spiral but after like a, a minute or so they they uncurl and start cruising around so i'm able to get photos and video these little land snails uh helicobiscus pretty easy you can just think of like a flat discus uh they they are eyeless well they have eyes but they don't work anymore so they're blind and then they just sense chemicals in the air with their four tentacles to find food and mates and whatever so once you get really deep into the cave you get the troglobites which are what i think are the coolest organisms so from the Greek troglos for cave and bio for life, the troglobites spend their entire lives in caves and cannot survive on the surface. So troglobites are relegated to like deeper in the cave where temperatures remain constant. And in central Texas, it usually remains about 72 degrees year round. And then humidity is near 100%. Um, So this here is Texella Mulaiki. It is a, a harvest man, so basically like a daddy long leg. But this one's pretty tiny and it can only live, yeah, super deep in the caves where it's moist all the time. These guys are only found in southern Travis County. One sorry. All right, screaming baby in the background. So yeah, these guys are only found in Southern Travis County and Northern Hayes County. So they're one of the most looking uh, troglobites, I think. Almost nothing is known about their diet or anything. So due to the nutrient limited environment, Troglobites tend to be small, have slower metabolisms, longer lifespan, and lay fewer eggs than their surface relatives. So that's a Texella mulaiki on my coworker Drew Thompson's finger. Other adaptions to life underground include uh, reduce, uh, I can't read this. Yeah, pigmentation, legs and antenna, enhanced tactile, vibratory, and olfactory senses. So you're gonna see like a lot of these, I have the genus name and then the species is SPP. That's because a lot of these organisms, we have multiple species in the Austin area. And this is due to the fact that there's a lot of geologically isolated areas that have evolved around species. Well, Central Texas now has only a dozen species of these Spheodesmus cave millipedes. And then a lot of the or other organisms as well are have very localized uh, range distributions. So these Tartar oak creatures, pseudoscorpions, uh, we got about seven species in the Austin area, but some of them are only known from a single cave location. So, pretty cool and we gotta make sure we protect the locations because these guys are very unique. So these guys don't have eyes but they have sensory hairs all over their body that they use uh, to, and they just run around with their arms out and so then when they run into prey they're able to grab them. Probably the most prolific troglobite, troglobitic predator are these Sicarina spiders. Uh, pretty much going to cave and start flipping rocks to find me. But they have no eyes at all and they just have to take those hairs. You see this one cleaning his feet. Got some big old fangs. You can imagine being a cave cricket and one of those things can be in back. But this one you can tell he's a male because his front petty palps are enlarged and look like little uh, boxing gloves. You can see on his on his head where the eyes would normally be, it's completely smooth and clear because the eyes have been completely eliminated so long underground. 
So this is one of our Rodiny species. We got three species in the Austin area. So these Rodiny beetles feed on cave cricket eggs and they've adapted a, a super elongated head and neck so that they can reach their head into the holes in the sandy or soil or dirt floor where the crickets lay their eggs. It's easier for them to pull out, pull out the eggs. So these passionetta spiders, they're extremely small, first of all, like the body length is like 1.5 millimeters. So it's really hard to get photos and videos of them. And what's really cool about them is they're basically see-through, but they reflect blue off of their legs when you shine a light on them. So pretty cool looking little creatures. Looks like they're made out of glass or something. So these Texoridelia, um, these are cave silverfish. Now these actually get pretty long. I don't know, they're like maybe like two, two inches long. This one's cleaning his antenna since he doesn't have eyes. We've got to keep his antenna nice and clean. You can see one of them got clipped off by, I don't know, page 50 or something. This guy's staying still long enough to get some pictures, but normally these guys are just constantly on the move as you'll see in this next video. So yeah, this is generally how we find Textorodelia textensis. It's constantly moving around. That's one of my favorite species names to say. Textorodelia textensis. Say that 10 times fast. This one, uh, this is from one of my YouTube videos y'all can check out later. Uh, so it actually has like words added. So this eyeless spider genus Eismanella barely escaped the pseudoscorpion Tartaro Craigus infernalis. So yeah, this is going to be this pseudoscorpion uses sensory hairs on its bodies and limbs to sense its environment. Its sensory hairs brushed up against the spider before it ran away, so it knows something is close. It slowly waves its pedipalps around, probing for its prey. The spider makes a bad move. With its abdomen in the grasp of the pseudoscorpion's pincer, there's little chance of escape. There are venom glands on the tips of the pincers. The pincer has punctured the abdomen and is injecting venom. You can see a small drop of liquid forming on the spider's abdomen. It's either hemo hemolymph or venom. Now the spider is basically paralyzed and then he can just chew them up at his leisure. So yeah, it's pretty miraculous how they will capture that. Um, not barely anyone's ever seen that interaction before. So yeah, if you're lucky enough to go deep enough in a cave and you find water, um, like a stream or a pool, you may get to see some stygobites. So from the Greek stygo for sticks and bio for life, in Greek mythology, the river Styx was the boundary to the underworld. So this is an underground stream, and you can see some aquatic isopods in the genus Cicadodia, as well as some aquatic amphipods in the genus Stygobromus. You can see how crystal clear the water is. There's no algae or anything since it's underground. Here you can see a bunch of cicadodia feeding on this cricket carcass. And here you can both see, see cicadodia and stygobromus feeding on this bark scorpion that fell into the water and drowned. So the 
Tiger brown mints are flattened side to side, look kind of like a little shrimp. While the Cicadodia isopod, they're flattened top to bottom. So this here is a cave planarian or a flatworm, Phyloplana mori. Basically almost nothing is known about them as far as I can tell. They don't even know what they eat. I mean, try Googling this thing. You'll find like a, a little drawing outline from like the 60s or something. That's about the extent of our knowledge. So probably need to do some more research on these guys. But they get pretty long up to about an inch long, which is pretty big flatworm. And yeah, if you're real lucky, you might even get to see salamanders in caves. So this is a Jollyville Plateau salamander. Uh, it's a relative of the Barton Springs salamander. We only have these in kind of northwest Travis County, southern Williamson County, up in northwest Austin and in the Cedar Park area. They live in springs, but also they live in caves that have streams. There's a lot of actually cave stream, uh, caves with streams up in the Buttercup area of Cedar Park that have these in them. And I'm going to show you all a few other species that I think are cool in these caves. So this is the Texas cave scorpion, Pseudoarachtinus fidelli. A lot of times you'll find these guys hanging out in little crevices and cracks near the entrance of a cave, and they wait for the crickets to exit at night, and then they reach out their pincers and grab them. This is Sooth Suthophilus cunicularis, a species of cave cricket. So these guys are more compact and kind of bright orange and shiny. Unlike the other cave crickets, these ones rarely, if ever, leave the cave. They just eat whatever they can find inside the cave. This is Suthophilus species B. So it's an undescribed species of cave cricket. It looks somewhat similar to Suthophilus secretus, but as you can see, it doesn't have all the dark patterning on its back. And it has this sort of a peach fuzz look on its lower abdomen. And also they're adults at different times of the year. So uh, Suthophilus secretus are adults in the summer. So right now there's like tons of them while I think these guys are adults in the winter. Some other cool organisms are diplur diplurins. Uh, this one's in family Campodiidae. Uh, these are super primitive invertebrates. They've been around for a long time. Their antenna look like they're basically made out of little glass beads strung together. And then they have two long sensory circe on the other end of their abdomen to sense their environment. And then these guys are really cool. You don't see them very often. I've been working at the city for almost four years, and I've maybe seen three of these. And some of the times these can get really big up to three inches long or bigger. And instead of the two Circe on the end of the tail, they have this big pincer that they use to capture and hold their prey while they consume them. And then one of my favorites are these Symphylans, which uh, most people, I guess, know about them because they're considered a garden pest. They're not really a cave organism. They're more of a soil dwelling organism, but we see them in caves all the time. And uh, it's pretty funny on my YouTube channel, my Symphylan video has like the most by far views because everyone's probably trying to figure out how to kill them. And then they find my video and they're like, oh, what the heck, this guy likes these things. So anyhow, you can check them out, they're, they're super cool. Since they don't have eyes or anything, they literally wave their antenna around and taste their environment, trying to find food and mates. I think they're adorable, but apparently some, some of them eat on roots of plants and stuff, so gardeners don't like them. <laughs> Another pretty obscure organism that we find in caves, but also just live in soil everywhere, are the micro-whip scorpions or Halpograda. 
radii. So these guys are extremely small and they have these weird bottle brush tails. Not much is known about them. Uh, a recent study found that some of them eat bacteria, which is pretty interesting because that would make them one of the few arachnids that doesn't eat animals. And then these guys are really cool. This is family Trichoniscidae. It's a family of soil dwelling isopods. So these guys are super tiny and they live in moist soil. So yeah, I normally find these like in moist soil by flipping over rocks. Um, I've been talking to like Ben Hutchins from Texas State about these guys. And basically he says all the species around here are undescribed. Um, so there's some work to be done if we got any taxonomists that want to name some species. Some of these species have eyes while others are completely eyeless. You can see this one here has some rudimentary eyes. But yeah, their, their antenna are apparently adapted to not only chemo sensing but also humidity sensing since these are isopods they need to stay moist so their antenna help them sense if they're going into a dry area and then they'll go back to where it's moister so yeah pretty much when i flip the rock over and shine my bright warm light on them they don't like that very much and they tend to fall away pretty quickly <laughs> Oops. Next. And finally, I'm going to show you all these globular springtails. So I tend to find these in caves. Um, I didn't really notice them before, but now I've found that if you look at the tiniest little pools of water in caves, you'll find these guys on the pool of water. And we think it may actually be because they're stuck in the middle of the pool. Um, but I'm talking like a pool of water that's like an inch and a half across and you'll end up with one of these guys sticking right in the middle of it. Mm. So these guys are so tiny that they don't even put an indention in the surface of the water at all. It's basically like they're walking on glass. Mm. So yeah, these guys get a bad rap, sort of like the Symphylums. Now a lot of gardening websites are like, how to get rid of all these terrible infestations of springtails but basically these things are good uh, for the environment they help aerate the soil and everything and also they just provide food for everything so don't mess with the springtails but yeah that's pretty much the end of our journey awesome thank you so much colin that was that was just some of the uh, just cool uh, the videos and, and and photographs that you shared are just some of the coolest that i've ever seen of the cave life. Um, a reminder to everyone watching that um, this video will be recorded and it will be posted to both the Travis County and um, City of Boston uh, YouTube pages and along with Facebook. So if you missed any parts of this or wanna go back and watch other parts, you'll be able to do that, share it with your friends. And then if you have any additional questions for Colin, go ahead and start throwing them in the Q&A and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, we do have a couple questions already, Colin, so I'll just read them off and we can just go through them from there. Um, one of the volunteers that helps us with uh, cave cricket counts often asked, do you know what the common species of mice are that we always see running around the cave entrances? Um, I can't remember the exact species name, but yeah, it's a, it's a species of deer mouse. Um, I'll have to get back to them about the exact species. I have it written down somewhere, but yeah. yeah they, we, we have a lot of white-footed deer mouse, is that some? I'm not sure, yeah. I just know the species name that I have in my list of creatures, but yeah, they're pretty funny. Uh, a lot of times they'll, yeah, they'll poke their head out and as long as you're staying like super still, they're very curious and they'll walk right up to within like two feet of your face 
to look at you before they go, oh no, human, and then run back in the cave. So that's awesome. Um, okay, another question is uh, would the cave crickets in our caves survive without the caves as a place to go during the day? Or would this species decline? It's hard to say. I mean, they definitely like being in the caves, but the cave crickets can live, you know, under houses and just like under logs and stuff. I guess if it was like super drought conditions, they might run into trouble, but you can find them uh, just like on my property here, I'm too low for there to be, I'm in the wrong geology, so there's no caves, but we have a lot of um, piles of logs with tarps over it. And sometimes when I'm digging through there, I find cave crickets under them. So um, probably there would be a lot less numbers without the caves, but they can definitely survive in some surface habitat. <laughs> Okay, this next question is a little bit of the, uh, the chicken or the egg conundrum here, but they said, it seems like um, many of the strictly cave dwellers are morphologically similar to the species above ground. So did the species, which species evolved from which? Did we get the cave species from the ground dwellers or the ground dwellers from the cave species? So basically the theory on how all these troglobites came about was um, a long time ago, millions of years ago, it was a lot moister in central Texas. And all of these species ancestors were surface or soil dwelling organisms. But as the climate changed, and then also there was the geology in this area, there being all this open space underground, a lot of these organisms just slowly adapted to move farther and farther underground and to the point where many of them became so adapted that they could no longer survive on the surface, thus becoming troglobites. But one of the problems when you become a troglobite is you can't go up to the surface and move over to another area. And so in central Texas, since we have so much faulting and everything, and uplift and displacement, a lot of the limestone areas are discontiguous. And so you end up with, um, originally these species were probably just a few species got pushed, but slowly adapted to go underground, but then the geology shifted and they all became little isolated islands, basically like island biogeography, where you have these karst islands that are separated by downcut river valleys and canyons, as well as just like uh, uplifts and shifting of the geology where the limestone layers no longer line up. And then that's how you end up with so many species, like 20 something species of Sicarina spiders in central Texas and a dozen species of Steodesmus millipede, like yeah, seven species of these Tartar Creager pseudoscorpions in the Austin area. Some of which are, yeah, only found in like one little karst plateau island. So you have like half a square mile. That's their entire range in the whole world. So it's pretty cool stuff. It is. It's just super fascinating. Um, and the next question, and we got a couple of people that ask similar versions of this question, but is what can we do to protect these this cave habitat for these organization or organisms? Well, what, what can you do? So if you don't want to kill cave crickets, please do not put ant bait outside, um, like using Amdro and stuff like that. These cave crickets come out of their cave and they harvest, uh, they, they forage in the forest for hundreds of meters away from the cave entrance. And unfortunately, since we have so many caves in Austin, specifically in like South Austin, as well as like Northwest Austin, uh, it, there ends up being like most of our caves in that area will have a bunch of houses within the cricket foraging range. So if people are putting pesticides out or yeah, like ant baits and stuff like that, the crickets will come and eat, eat them and die. Um, there was a, a case where we had a cave and there was nearby soccer fields and some of the people were putting 
ant baits out and then we went to the cave and found thousands of dead cave crickets inside because they were eating the ant baits. So basically what you want to do is, yeah, try to not put out any kind of chemicals because the chemicals will, if they're not just picked up by an organism, they'll also wash, wash in the runoff and pour into the cave and contaminate the caves. So best to, yeah, not, if you could, yeah, zero scape your lawn, things like that, not be using a bunch of fertilizers and everything. Those are a lot of the ways you can help protect these caves. And, and this next question kind of ties into that, and I believe it's much of the same answer for, as far as like uh, runoff pollution, but it's how does the pollution of the karst waters affect your cave populations of the organisms? Yeah, mostly for like, for the terrestrial troglobitic species, it probably doesn't affect them too much unless it was really bad pollution. But for these like stygobitic species and like the salamanders and stuff, they they need like pristine water. If there's like any contamination at all, like oil runoff or pesticides or anything, I mean, they're like literally breathing the water. It's like absorbing into their skin and will kill them. And uh, that's like another big misconception is like everybody thinks like, oh, the soil is filtering everything. But when we get these big storms, they, it's just like pouring into a cave entrance unfiltered. And there's not like a strainer or anything. I mean, the cave is big enough that I can crawl through it. So if I can get through, <laughs> so can all these other things. And it all goes straight into the aquifer. Uh, basically no filtration. That is why when as much as possible around cave entrances, you want to have a really big green area with natural vegetation because it will at least slow down and absorb a bunch of the stuff into the soil, which will somewhat filter it rather than if it's been, if the area has been urban, uh, covered in urban uh, surfaces that are non-permeable, then all of all of it just washes super fast. And then once it hits soil, it rips up the soil and washes it all into the cave and can cause a big problem. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, the next one came up when you were talking about the uh, micro whip scorpions. Um, are they related to the species of the above ground whip scorpions that you see in, in West Texas? I, I'm sure they're distantly related, but um, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's some, they're, they're apparently found just in the soil around here. I mean, you'd be surprised. Uh, you can, you can just go out into the woods around here. And if you uh, collect a bunch of moist leaf litter, put it in this thing called the Berlizzi funnel, where it's like a metal funnel and you put a light with a hole in the bottom, you put a light on the top, and it slowly drives out all the material. All these little creatures that live in the leaf litter and soil will fall out of the bottom into your jar and you'll get micro whip scorpions, mites, all sorts of different species of springtails, um, even yeah, little pseudo scorpions and stuff that are surface species. And so these are like basically, uh, a lot of these creatures end up by finding their way into caves, either getting washed in or just crawling down a crack uh, next to some tree roots. And then when they end up and they're like, oh, it's nice here. It's like 100% humidity all the time. I think I'll stay. And so that's how we end up with a lot of these soil organisms down in the caves. That's awesome. Um, okay, unless anyone has any other questions, we have one more here. We could uh, end on a light note here. It's, uh, and I think you hinted hinted at this during your talk, but what is your favorite karst invertebrate? I know it's hard to pin a biologist on their favorite uh, critter, but what do you think? Well, yeah, for uh, my, my favorite's gotta be the Tartaro Creagris, just because they're so, they're so wicked looking with their giant pincers and they're covered in hairs and everything. So uh, that's my favorite. Awesome. Yeah, I have to say that the video that you showed of the springtail walking across, across the water without any, just looking like a sheet of glass is just, was just super cool. I'd never seen that before. It was just awesome. That was like probably my second favorite. It's hard to say. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, that wraps up the questions that we have submitted. Um, Colin, I just want to say thank you. Uh, 